Now let's go back to this question of how do we handle multiple concurrent clients connecting to the same web server and thus the same database. We saw that in this very simple example where two patrons were trying to check out a book with the exact same serial number at the same time, um, the system automatically handled this for us. Since these insert commands are done in a transaction, the transaction will automatically cause one of them to succeed and one of them will fail. And the one that fails will fail due to a primary key violation since it's trying to insert the same serial number into the database. But let's look at a more interesting example involving more than one SQL command. So let's say we wanted to modify the database so that we always need to leave at least one copy of every book for the library so that maybe people that are at the library in person can have something to read. So you could imagine a way to do this is do some kind of select query that finds the number of books left that are available to check out. And if that's less than or equal to one for whatever title, then we throw an error and tell the patron that they can't check out that book since it's the last available copy. Um, otherwise, we do the insert, so we allow them to insert a row into the checked out table and thus check out the book. Um, so each of these two SQL queries are going to be one operation, and thus they are both going to run in their own separate transactions. So there'll be one transaction for the select and a different transaction for the insert. And then there's a little bit of C-sharp logic in between just to check the count. So let's actually look at the code. I've actually modified my library web server to do this. So here's the checkout book controller. And I've, I've already modified it to add this restriction where we're not going to let somebody check out the last available copy. Um, so let's look at the queries here. They're a little more complicated than you might think, and that's just because we're given a serial number, we're not given a title, so we need to take that serial number and kind of work backwards to find the other serial numbers for a book of the same title. Um, but don't worry too much about these queries, they're kind of just some simple count queries. Let's just look at the end result here. So I have copies query dot count minus checked out queries dot count. So that's going to be the total number of queries minus the num or the total number of copies minus the number of them that are checked out. And I just save that into some available variable. So if number of available is less than or equal to one, then I just return false. So the the web server is not going to let me check out the last book. Um, otherwise then I just add a a row to the checked out table and save the changes. So let's run this and just verify that it works as intended. Okay, I'm just going to log in with a certain patron. So here are all of the books. Um, let's check out one of these copies of Harry Potter with the serial number 1001. Okay, it says I've checked it out. Let's try to check out the last available copy of Harry Potter with a different serial number. Okay, and it doesn't actually throw an error. I didn't make it report an error, but it just didn't let me do the checkout. So it's, it's working as intended. But let's see what happens when we do this with two clients at the same time. So let's try to have one client check out this copy and another client check out this copy at exactly the same time. And we'll, so we'll try to simulate a race condition and see what happens. So I'm going to close this and then I'll just manually go into the database and reset the checked out table so that we have those avail copies available to retry the experiment. But there's no way I would be able to actually click fast enough in two different browsers to actually uh, expose this race condition if there is a race condition. So I'm just going to simulate me being able to do that by slowing things down. So right here after checking if the number of available um, is greater than or greater than one. 
Um, I w but before adding a row to the checked out table, let's just slow things down here. So I'll just add in a sleep for five seconds. And let's try it out. So I'll restart the web server. And while that's starting up, I'm going to get another browser window ready to go. So I will have two clients at the same time. And let's just wait for the web server to start and get one of them logged in. Okay, so let's log in as Dan. And then I'm just going to copy this URL over into my other browser. Okay, so we now have two clients connected at the same time. So I will have this one try to check out this book, and I'll have this one try to check out that book. And it will look unresponsive since I put that sleep in there, but let's see what happens. So we'll check out that, and then check out that. And then we'll wait five seconds. Okay, so we got something kind of weird here. This one refreshed and says that only this book is checked out and this one is not. This one refreshed and said that both of them are checked out. And that's just because this one refreshed before this one had successfully checked out. If I manually refresh this other browser, they do both indeed show that somebody has somehow managed to check out the very last copy of Harry Potter, which the code is not supposed to allow. But the reason it is allowing it is because there's a race condition here. So what's happening is, let's say that they both click on the checkout button at the same time, and both clients get to this point in the code at the same time. So how is that possible that they could both get here at the same time? Well, they're both running these queries to compute the count, the number of copies available. They're both running this check to see if there are enough copies available, but they've queried the same database, so they, they both think that there are still two copies available. And they get past the check before any of them inserts anything into the database. So they both see uh, an available count, and then they both get past the check, and then they both insert their own different rows into the checked out table. And since we checked out two different serial numbers, it's fine, there's no primary key violation. Um, it just allows them both to check out the books. So this is, you know, just a classic race condition. So how can we fix it? Well, maybe we can do something like this. Maybe we can use a transaction to fix it. So maybe start the transaction and then do all that logic, find the count, check the availability, and then insert, and then commit. Let's try it out. So the first thing I'm going to do is just reset that checked out table again so that the Harry Potter books are available again. And then let's go and take a look at our controller. So to start a transaction when you're using link, unfortunately it's not as easy as just like as it is in MySQL where you just do start transaction as a command. Um, when using link, there are some API calls involved to get a transaction object and start it. So I've already got that code just down here ready to go. So let's just copy it and then rather than typing it all out, we'll just kind of look at what it's doing. So those four lines there are what's going to set up a transaction. First, so DB is the library context object. That's just the thing that represents the database connection db.database.getDBConnection.open. So that's just manually opening the database connection, and we have to have a connection open before starting a transaction. Normally with link, the connection is not actually open until you start doing something with the result of a link query. So we just need to open it ourselves the first thing we do. Okay, then I make a transaction variable, which is going to be the object representing the transaction. So I just do get connection again, and then dot begin transaction. So that will start the transaction. Now this one here, 
database.autotransactions enabled equals false. What is that about? Well, let me go down to where I'm inserting a row into the table. Remember, we use db.savechanges to insert in link. And I talked about in a previous lecture that save changes automatically does all of its changes inside of its own transaction. And you can't have nested transactions. So if we want to start our own transaction, um, we have to disable auto transactions so that this won't try to start another one inside of the one that we're, that we're making manually. So that's what that is all about. And then finally, we just tell the database, the library context, to use that transaction object that we created up here. Okay, so the transaction is started. Now what we would do is, down here, if we have discovered that the number of available copies is not enough, then we can transaction.rollback. And we don't actually need to manually do this. As soon as we return and the transaction goes out of scope, it will be rolled back, but it's always better to be explicit. And then after db.savechanges, we can do transaction.commit. Okay, so basically all we've done is wrap what we already had with this logic about trying to prevent checking out the last copy. We've wrapped all of that into a transaction. Um, it looks a lot uglier in C Sharp than it does in just the MySQL terminal, but you know once you get this, it's just ready to go and you don't have to worry about it. So let's try that out. I'm going to restart the web server and then I'll get two browsers open again and we'll see if the problem is solved, if the race condition is solved. Okay, while that's loading, let me get another browser ready to go. Let me put them on the same sides they were on last time. Okay, we'll log in with Dan again. Copy the URL. And let's just try the same experiment. I'll check out one over here and one over there. And then we'll wait five seconds. Okay, so we see that I was still able to check out both copies. And if I just manually refresh this page, they both reflect that. So it's still letting me check out the last copy of Harry Potter, despite this code that's supposed to prevent that, and despite wrapping it all in a transaction. So I have two clients running. They're both going to do this inside of a transaction, but it's still not solving the problem. So what is going on there? The problem is that a transaction is not a mutex. It does not provide mutual exclusion. In other words, it will not prevent uh, two different sessions or two different transactions from running simultaneously like a mutex does. A transaction's job is just to ensure consistency. So it makes sure that an operation cannot partially complete. It will either fully fail or fully succeed. And transactions will actually only synchronize with each other when they need to. Sometimes they do need to synchronize, like a mutex does. So the difference here is a mutex is basically lock and unlock. It's for locking a region of code. And it just allows one thread or session in at a time. A transaction, it, it's not lock and unlock. It's start and then either roll back or commit. And so not only are the names different, they are, they are well named and they mean different things. A transaction will allow multiple threads or sessions in at the same time. So this does not work. Simply wrapping this critical section code in a transaction, all this does is guarantee that each of those transactions will fully fail or fully succeed. It won't prevent both of them from entering at the same time. So let's just kind of walk through the timeline of what what is happening in this example. Um, we're trying to check out two different copies of the same title. So we're trying to check out serials 1001 and 1002, and we have two sessions. So here's like the first browser, here's the other browser. And time is going down on the uh, on the down axis. 
So the, let's say the first session starts its transaction and then the second session starts its transaction. This is already the problem. If this was a mutex, then the second se session would stall right here as soon as trying to start. Uh, or in other words, as soon as trying to acquire the lock. But it's fully free to start the transaction. It's, that's not what a transaction does. And then they can both do their select count from whatever in order to figure out how many copies uh, are still available to check out. This does not interfere with each other as far as a transaction is concerned, and they can both just go right ahead at the same time. The transaction will not try to prevent this. Okay, and then the first one can do its um, count check. If there's enough available, then it will insert 1001 into the checkout table. The second one has already selected its count. So the fact that the other one has done its insert doesn't matter. It's already too late, and it can go ahead and insert 1002, and then they can both commit. Furthermore, um, even, if, even if this select had happened a little later, like after this insert, it hasn't been committed yet. So the, these two transactions are isolated, and it wouldn't, it wouldn't see that commit anyway. So it's going to see, it's going to select its own count, do its own check, and then insert its own serial number. So there's no problem here at all as far as transactions are concerned. One of them is inserting serial 1001, one of them is inserting serial 1002. There's no primary key violation, and transactions don't care if another transaction is doing a select at the same time. That's not considered interference, and so they don't synchronize. So if they're not synchronizing with each other, then what does the isolation part, the I of ACID, what does that really mean? Uh, transactions cannot interfere with each other, even if they're concurrent. So when do they synchronize with each other? Well, this particular example didn't require any synchronization because the operations they're doing are not considered to interfere with each other. So let's look at what is considered interference. Um, we can change the isolation level, so we can change what is considered interference. Let's look at the default behavior first. So session one and session two can both be running transactions. One of them can be changing data while another one is selecting data. That's fine. That's not considered interference. Let's, here's another example. Session one and session two both running a transaction. One of them can insert into the titles table, one of them can insert into the patrons table at the same time, and that is not considered interference. These will both proceed uh, concurrently. In fact, they could even be inserting into the same table as long as the rows that, they're, that they are inserting don't conflict with each other. So what about this? Two transactions now both trying to insert into the same table, patrons and they are both trying to insert a patron with a card number of one. Card number is the primary key in the patrons table. So what's going to happen here? Well, as soon as they try to commit, one of them will succeed, one of them will fail. It will automatically roll back and just anything else that happened in that transaction will be undone. And this is automatically handled by the DBMS using the default isolation level. And we'll see what the other isolation levels do a little later on. But let's just go back into SQL terminals and experiment with the default transaction isolation level behavior. So I have my two terminals again here both in the transaction demo database, two different sessions. Um, let's just select star from A, see what's in there. So it's still just got a five in there from before. Uh, the demo I was doing before, I was only starting a transaction in one of my sessions, and I wasn't using a transaction in the other. So this time, let's start a transaction in both. Okay, now again, this is already very different from a mutex. I was able to start a transaction in both, whereas a mutex would have locked one of them up and just stalled one of the sessions. So let's experiment. I can, let's select A, star from A. I can 
select star from A in the other transaction, and no problem. Selecting is not interfering. Um, let's try inserting some things. So remember X is the primary key in this table. So over here in the first session, let's insert into the table, let's insert a six. Okay, it says it's okay. If I select star, I can see the six in that session. If I select star in my other session, I still can't see it, but I am allowed to do the select. There's still no interference. Okay, now let's insert something in the other transaction. So let's insert into a values, let's insert a seven. So I inserted a six up here, a seven down here should be okay. Those are different primary keys. And it says okay. If I select star, I can now see a 5 and a 7 in this transaction. If I select everything from my other terminal, I can still just see the 5 and the 6. So now what happens if I start committing these transactions? Let's commit this one first. So I'll just run commit. Okay. Let's select star. It can still only see the 5 and the 6. So if I've committed this other transaction, let's see what this one can see if I select star. Still can't see the six, even though it's been committed and thus made permanent in the database. But this transaction is still running, and so this other session is still kind of in its own little sandbox, and it can't see the six. But if I commit it, now if I come back to this other session and select everything, now I have five, six, and seven, and this one agrees. Both of them have committed their transactions. They were both able to run transactions at the same time where they inserted different primary keys into this database. And they were both able to do any kinds of selecting that they wanted without any, any kind of synchronization between the two. So let's try another experiment now. Let's start a new transaction in both sessions. And let's try inserting the same primary key in both of these transactions. So I'll insert into A values 10. And then I'll try doing the same thing down here. And now notice this one just hangs uh, because the system has automatically detected that this transaction, this, sorry, this transaction would interfere with the transaction that's going on in this other session because they're both trying to insert the same primary key. Um, notice though, it doesn't immediately fail, it just holds up because it doesn't know what's going to eventually happen. I might decide to roll back this transaction and then this one down here could go ahead. So let's actually just do that. Let's roll back the top one and watch what happens in both sessions as soon as I do this. Now the bottom transaction is able to go ahead and do its insert, and this one's now no longer running any transactions, so everything's been undone. Let's select star, and the 10 is still not in there because this transaction still hasn't been committed. So if I select star over here, it can see the 10, but that's just a sandbox, a temporary 10 until I commit it. So if I do commit it, now both of these sessions should be able to see the 10. Okay, so another experiment to try is what happens if I don't roll back the first transaction? What if I commit it? So let's start a new transaction again in both sessions. And let's try to insert 11. So that one goes ahead and it's okay, but it's a temporary insert. We haven't committed anything yet. If I try to insert 11 over here, it hangs. It doesn't know if it can go ahead yet. It's detected the conflict. Now what if I commit? So watch what happens in both terminals. This one succeeds. This one just immediately says duplicate entry for primary key. So as soon as it can resolve the conflict, it can then decide whether to let 
the other transaction proceed or whether to make it fail. So if I select star from A over here, the 11 is there. If I select star from A over here, the 11 is there, even though I never actually ended this transaction explicitly. The system ended it for me. It rolled it back because it knew it was going to fail as soon as I committed this other one with the conflicting primary key. So that's how it works by default, but again, we can change the way that transactions, how and when they decide to um, coordinate with each other and synchronize with each other.